We're going to turn to Gaelic football now, though. Very happy to say we're joined by former Derry player Conleith Gilligan. Conleith, great to have you on. Great to be on, thanks. So it's not every weekend the defending All-Ireland champions are blown out of the water. That was uh, something of a statement, to say the least. Tyrone, 10 points. Derry, 118 in Oma. That's a first Ulster Championship win over Tyrone since 06. Yeah, look, it's been a long time coming and within those number of years, Derry have shipped a lot of heavy defeats and unfortunately I've been involved in, in quite a few of them. So it was a long time coming and I suppose this time last week, while we thought it might be tight, probably nobody seen what was coming. We knew Derry were coming strong. Probably most people thought they wouldn't have enough to trouble the All-Ireland champions, but look, they absolutely blew them out of the water with a first-class performance. Rory Galler took over in 2019. At that stage, Derry were not far removed from Division 4. It felt like things were just not good in a host of ways around Derry football. And yeah, you know, things improved for sure and league performances absolutely improved. Then last year with, you know, a straight knockout, you lose to Donegal by a point, that's it. You wrap it up for a whole other season. So uh, league performances aside, it's hard to know exactly where Derry are, to what extent they are performing. What has Rory Gallagher done over the last 18 months, 24 months? You see, even going back before that, the one thing that Rory Gallagher has brought is a bit of stability. Because prior to that, there was a cycle of every two years, Derry maybe didn't do well and then a new manager came in for two years. He brought in a couple of players throughout, some players. So there was never really a development plan. There was always good players, but this Rory Geller's been the first man really from, um, probably even Coleman, that got, got any length of time to develop anything. So um, from that point of view, he's brought stability. And then a lot of stuff happened that was a real advantage to him. He had a young panel, and then COVID happened. So there's no travelling and there's no players leaving. And he had their undivided attention, and he had them in the palm of his hands. And to be fair... They have worked really hard, as hard as any team I would imagine in any of the 32 counties. And look, he has brought them to this stage now. And look, he deserves huge credit for that. And along with that, um, the rest of his management team, because, you know, he's just one person. There's a lot of people behind the scenes that have done a lot of work. Like, and I suppose my own club mate, Enda Muldoon, has been in the background as well. So there's been a lot of players come and go, but the group he has now seems to be the players that he wanted. Obviously, Kieran McFall stepped away, um, speculated to go travelling and play football in the States. So, other than that, every other player he wanted is there. And there's been a fluidity about the team. He's played very similar teams all through the league. So there's been no chopping and changing. So there was a great blend, but they seemed to know what they were at. And they sort of blew thrown away on Sunday, uh, something that I suppose none of us expected. No. Conlon, you're not a Liverpool fan, are you? Uh, not, I wouldn't follow it greatly, but I'd, I'd, I like Liverpool now, I have to say. A lot of my friends are big Liverpool fans, so okay. I'd be a... Interested on looker. How are we going now? Well, a lot of your friends are going to be upset right now because Villarreal have just scored a second goal, so it's 2 2 on aggregate. Francis Coquelin and the place has just erupted. So they're in for a proper game this evening all of a sudden. So just updating the listeners in that situation. Francis Coquelin header uh, 2 2. Back to Derry then. So that's interesting in terms of Gallagher having time to work with the players and a young group so he can mould them in his image. Now, if you stop someone in the street and say Rory Gallagher, they would be inclined to say defensive football. What kind of football is he playing? I haven't seen a huge amount of Derry, but I was watching, you know, yes, men behind the ball over the weekend, but I was also watching a half-back line from minute one breaking forward and 118 is a very respectable scoreline. Yeah, look, I suppose it'd be lazy to, to, to talk about Rory Gallagher and defensive football because obviously when he was with Fermanagh, for example, you know, he got the most out of them, but he probably didn't have the same riches. You know, it's a smaller county. There's less clubs, probably less playing pool. Like what he does have now, he's got a group of players and he has picked players that have pace, that have power and, and are really good footballers into that. So yes, they're defensive. Yes, they get men behind the ball. But so do Dublin. You know, so are Kerry. Mm. You know, that's just modern football now. And, and anybody that thinks it's not is absolutely deluded, deluded. And he's got the blend completely right because like Gareth McInnes lined out at six, played at eight. But you could play Gareth McInnes in any of the three lines, half-back, midfielder, half-forward line. He's just so pacey, so dynamic. And, and for me, his performance was just out of this world when the game was there to be won. Yeah, I know he didn't get man of the match, but for me, the one player that won the game when it was there to be won was Gareth McInnes. The rest of the boys were brilliant, but just doing the stuff right to the edge, um, you know, like he was involved in, and, and all the good moves in the first half that gave him the platform. But it really was up until... Up to the 25th minute, it was still game on. Tyrone hadn't looked like going. But they had a couple of goal chances themselves. And had they taken one of that, probably they'd have given themselves a better platform. But from the 25th minute on, Neil Lachlan got a free. 
and right from the kick out, then obviously Kennedy gets sent off. Two minutes later, Derry get a penalty. Once it goes in, it was going to be very hard to see Tyrone coming back from that. Had enthusiasm around Derry football wilted over the last decade, Conleth, amongst fans? Yeah, very much so. Um, and again, I suppose, look, there's a lot of theories as to why that is. And, and obviously the club scene in Derry is so strong. And there was this probably notion, which is very unfair and was wrong, that the, the players in Derry didn't like each other because of the club rivalry. And, and like that was just nonsense. But again, the fact that clubs were so strong. So like, in fairness, like when Dibby McArlane was manager, like he had a, he had a run of three, two years where Slock Neil got to back-to-back all Ireland club finals. So he was without five or six of his best players through the league. Derry get relegated, and then he has to go to a, a, a lower division, and he still is without you know your Brenton Rogers, your Chrissy McKeggs, you know your Paul McNeils that are there now. It's just to name a few. So previous managers were unlucky because all the Derry clubs that seemed to get out, they went far in Ulster and, and beyond. So it, it's there's no one big thing that was wrong, but there could have been twenty small things. And look, a lot of that stuff's been ironed out, and as well as that, players leaving the panel, drifting out halfway through a season. No, that generally hasn't happened. A few have defected over the last while, but you know that's travelling in circumstances. Tyrone are a strange team to get a read on at the moment. You mentioned from 25 minutes that Derry really took over. In part, that was because of that Brian Kennedy red card. And even at that stage, it was only a three-point deficit, but it was like a, a lash out of frustration. It's the kind of thing you see when a team is just really fed up and a player does something silly like that. And... We've seen, uh, speaking of players walking away, we've seen player after player leaving Tyrone. That's a strange thing when you're talking about defending All-Ireland champions and their performances across the league have been very average. Initially, we thought, well, maybe it's just because they haven't the base of training done. But I think now we can look at Tyrone and say there's something gone very, very wrong here. What's your read on Tyrone? What are you hearing about Tyrone? Straight away, look, I for one wouldn't write their obituary just yet because the one thing about Tyrone is whenever their backs are to the wall and you think there's not much left in them, they come out swinging. And I think this could be the catalyst for them to do that again. But look, as you touched on, you know, Tiernan McCann, Mark Bradley, Lee Brennan, Hugh Pat McGeary, Paul Danaghy, you know, leaving a panel, like it does leave a deficit in quality in terms of your training and the standards. And the one thing the likes of Tiernan McCann and Mark Bradley had was serious quality. And with the players like them on the bench, and like last year, Tyrone were springing McShane to the bench, you know, Connor McKenna, uh, Dara Canavan. So Tyrone just had more resources. Um, but the other bit is like Matty Donnelly's been injured, Richie Donnelly's injured, you know, Peter Hart played that game injured. So there has been a lot of players that Tyrone in the past have banked on that weren't there. So um, I don't think it's just as simple as saying they've walked away. I think probably they'd be disappointed. And like in one of the podcasts, Darren McCurry said how disappointed he was. But look, players play because they want to play. And when the heart and your bait has gone for it, you no, know, staying when you don't want to be there is the wrong reasons as well. So any player that did walk away, they walked away for the right reasons I, from what I can gather. So um, I don't doubt the players there. But there was just a lot of stuff that went wrong. Um, like the eyes at the Fermanagh game. And Tyrone played against Derry pretty much exactly the way they played against Fermanagh. It was a wee bit flat for periods. Then Conor Mailer got the goal and they sprung to life when Conor McKenna came on. And I was expecting maybe that to happen. But once the sending off happened... The one thing about Rory Gallagher's teams, like defensively, they're sound. Derry were never going to cough up a goal and they were always keeping the plus one at the back. So um, what's going wrong for Tyrone? It's very hard to tell, but they will have four weeks now at least. And it's going to be a very hard four weeks of soul searching. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to come up with a plan defensively because they look very, very fragile at the back. You know, anybody at the game could hear Rory Gallagher shouting, they've no sweeper, they've no sweeper. And he wanted Derry to kick ball in. So um, very on Tyrone, like, in, in terms of what they've done from last year. Obviously, Michael O'Neill missing, not playing the last day. He gives them defensive structure. So I would imagine they're going to have to look at playing Michael O'Neill again like last year and just giving them a wee bit of structure at the back because they did look very open. And individually, they just had so many players underperformed. You know, really top-class footballers just didn't perform. And outside of probably Darren McCurry, um, Connor Mailer worked hard. Derry had the better of their men in every other single position other than that. Yeah, they sure did. So the situation in Ulster is Cavan Donegal in one semi final, and now Derry are in against Monaghan on May the 15th. Like a lot of people, because championship action has been so limited, 
I don't have a great feel for the possibilities for this Derry team. I, I don't know if they massively overperformed here at the weekend or is that a, a kind of performance you could see them putting together against Monaghan next day out, Connacht? Like, what, what's a, a realistic expectation of Derry over the next couple of weeks? Well, I suppose when you look at Derry, like it's, if they were in any other province here, you know, but to have to beat the All-Ireland champions, they had to have to beat another top Division One team and they had to have to beat possibly if... if Donegal carry the favourite tags and win. To win those three games to win the Ulster Championship when you compare it with Munster. But um, looking for evidence, if you look at what Derry done in their one outing last year, they were arguably the better team on the day. Yeah. Um, probably an experience caught them a wee bit um, against Donegal. They could easily have won that match had there been a backdoor last year. They were going into that in a good position. Monaghan are a different prospect and I would imagine Monaghan are rubbing their hands at Tyrone are gone because Tyrone have the wee Indian sign on them. Even when Monaghan played well in previous years, they still came out and one point down and they just couldn't seem to get over the line. So they'll really fancy Derry. But the one thing about Rory Geller's teams, he will change it. He will tactically get it right. He has showed time and time again in the Ulster Championship that he can pull out one-off massive performances. But look, it's a massive ask for Derry to go again from as a Division Two team, albeit almost getting promoted. They have to be two of the better teams in Division One, and probably Monaghan finished the league in great form they continued it against Down and shot the lights out. And look, it's going to be very difficult. But Rory Geller has got the man there at the back to get the match up straight as he showed against Tyrone. And look, Derry have momentum now. It's the first time that I remember in a long time whenever Derry supporters went down to the pitch. Like, and I don't know whether that gives the players a real a real boost or not. Um, but for me, standing at the sideline watching it, you know, it was great pride because it had been devoid, it had been lacking. And all the supporters in Derry really wanted was a team and a set of performances to be proud of. And look, it'll be hard, but, you know, Derry travelled to, to Armagh in two weeks' time, full of hope and expectation, but knowing that Monaghan are another serious challenge. Mm. And it's such a brilliant football county, so I presume there'll be a big upsurge in support and attendance and hype and people stopping and chatting on the streets as opposed to saying, geez, how bad can it get? Suddenly it's something yeah, good well, look, to talk about. You know, we've had a decade of that. And again, you know, like in the middle of the stand, there's a loyal band of supporters and, you know, through thick and thin, they were travelling in small numbers, but they still travelled, and that number will grow. And again, if you look at the standard of the, the football that Derry played, yeah. yes, look, the caveat is Tyrone were down to 14 men. Um, but even whenever it was for the first 25 minutes, you know, you could hear, you know, from the sideline, asking Chrissy McKeague to attack, asking Brenton Rogers to attack. So it wasn't that they wanted to sit in and suck up the pressure and hit them on the counter. They wanted to take the game to Tyrone, and you heard whenever Tyrone were open, they really went for it. And, Yes, I know Tyrone were, they were flat um, and it's hard to know why, but like I know a long time after the players, the Tyrone players stayed in the changing room and I would imagine it probably wasn't nice, a nice place to be. But look, they've been there before. They're all earning champions. They've a host of all-stars. They have a savage amount of quality. So I would write Tyrone off at of peril because every time I would doubt them and in the past I have, I thought last year against Kerry that no chance. Yeah. And then I thought Mayo would beat them and I've kept getting it wrong. So... This could be the catalyst to get a kickstart in Tyrone and no team in this back door is going to want to, to draw Tyrone. No. They'll go away now, they'll all grow beards and they'll come back and they'll win the All-Ireland and we'll replay this conversation. Uh, so uh, just a brief mention of the other aspects of the weekend. Claire Limerick went to penalties, which is brutal in its own way. I, I Personally, I think it's, a, it's about the best way to finish these games if they can't go to replays they've tried their kicks from 45 metres 30 metres it never seems to to quite work would you have a great issue as a player being knocked out on penalties I know you wouldn't like it but is it about the best way to settle these things like for me I was only following on Twitter because obviously it wasn't live you couldn't stream it anywhere and I kept looking for somebody's going to be videoing this on like a live Facebook feed and I couldn't get it <laughs> and mad looking to see it and look I think like how many WhatsApp groups are you in whenever a Champions League match is going to penalties, all of a sudden, games going to penalties yeah. and you start turning on games because the excitement, yeah. yes, there's go it's going to be terrible for the player that misses a kick, but it's also terrible for the player who misses a free kick and at least in a penalty, one of your team has a, a shot at determining the outcome. So the mm. goalie can't save it. So at least you have a team member where a free kick from 30 or 35 metres, it's up to, to you and there's no other intervention bar the, the elements. So look, I'm all for penalty shootouts. The games, the window's too narrow um, to have the games replayed at the minute. So it has to be finished in the day. And I think penalties is about as fair a way as doing it. I know it doesn't suit the traditionalists. 
you know, they'll want replay and three replays and four replays, but <laughs> that's that's not there anymore. No. So I think penalties is as good a way as any. And I would imagine, given Claire and Limerick, <laughs> you know, haven't looked at back, you know, it looked, and, and this is possibly, probably wrong, but it looked like Limerick practiced penalties in the hope of getting it, and Claire decided that it probably wasn't going to get that length and maybe didn't. And look, maybe that's been unfair in the Clare players because the one thing that Clare, like they're the highest ranked monster team um, in the league and they'll be really disappointed at this because this was probably their shot to a monster final and they've been so unlucky in other years based on the, how the draw has been for them. Well, listen, the good times are back in Derry, Connacht. Thanks so much for uh, checking in. Might be chatting to you across the course of the championship. No problem at all. Thanks very much, Connacht Gilligan there, a former Derry player. So Derry knocking... Uh, Tyrone out of the Ulster Championship as we mentioned just there Limerick winning on penalties against Clare in the quarterfinal of Munster and I suspect we'll come back to the dubs against Wexford not too much to read into their win given how good they were and how easily they won Brian Fenton was certainly very good Conan Callaghan back scored an 11th uh, championship goal and then Kildare uh, very impressive against Loud so it'll be Kildare Westmead Dublin Mead in the Leinster semi-finals double header at Crow Park our Gaelic football coverage on off the ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the GEA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. And just to let you know as well, the football pod with Paddy Andrews, James O'Donoghue is hitting the road this summer. First day up, they are going to the Royal Theatre Castle Bar on Thursday, June 2nd, where Paddy and James and Tommy will chat all things Mayo, all things Championship 2022 in the usual football pod style, plus uh, maybe a local legend or two as well. So if you're interested... Thursday, 2nd of June, Castle Bar, the Royal Theatre, Paddy and James, the football bubble, Paddy and James, on June 2nd. And tickets are on sale now. You can go to otbsports.com forward slash events to get yours.